<laughs> well, right at the end of our last lecture, I was just uh, introducing projective techniques and saying that, the, you know, the first one that uh, we became familiar with were word association tests. And I was saying to you that, you know, often if you give people neutral words uh, and you get back a series of responses, you will learn something about the person. And, and the example I used, you know, was uh, someone who kind of responded very negatively to whatever stimulus you give them. Now, there, there are some where, uh, you know, you deliberately choose us to give words that have more meaning than others. And I was thinking about a case where at one time I was working in a state hospital and uh, with very, very troubled people. And I was uh, working on a research project and, and we gave certain stimulus uh, words to people. And they, they had choices. They, 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 they were supposed to give you a synonym. So you gave them a word and they were supposed to give a synonym. And, but you gave them, I think it was four choices. So you gave them a word that was a synonym. You gave a word that was an antonym. You gave a word that was somewhat close, but not quite a synonym. And then you gave uh, usually a nonsense uh, word or a, uh, or a word that had no meaning. So it's close to nonsense. And so I was uh, testing a man, uh, a very psychotic man, who had a PhD in English. And I give him the stimulus word. And of course, he's getting all these words right. Uh, even as a psychotic person, it's, with his background, he's gonna, he knows what a synonym is. So he gets to about the first five or six words. We finally get to the word mother. And the synonym, I think, in this case was lady. So he looks at it, he says, aha. I, he says, I know, and this is a wonderful psychotic mind. He says, I know you want me to say lady. He said, but I'm not giving you that answer. I'm going to choose schmother, <laughs> which was kind of the clang nonsense syllable that was a choice. And he did. You know, he chose schmother. And you know, so later on, I go look in his chart, and I realize, read this long history of conflict between he and his mother, uh, that she was the one who put him in the hospital, that there are all kinds of unresolved issues with him. But it's, it's fascinating, you know, in this world where you, you give people uh, a word, and often most of us would think, well, you know, we, if you give these four choices, it's fairly obvious what you should choose. But aha, not necessarily the case. Sometimes the, uh, the people give you a, a tremendous amount of clinical information by the way they respond to this. Well, now I, what I want to do is take us on to uh, a test that, you know, has almost become synonymous with psychology. In fact, often when you say testing, people think about ink blots and about the Rorschach ink blot test. And the, the Rorschach ink blot uh, test, uh, I think, I believe I've already mentioned, it was developed by a psychiatrist, actually, a man named Herman Rorschach. Uh, but it's a test that really obviously was taken over by psychology and it's been used for a long time. And the hypothesis in this particular technique and in a projective techniques in general is that they get at deeper aspects of personality and they tend to kind of uniquely tap each person because each person will give different responses depending on what he or she uh, is experiencing. Now, in the Rorschach inkblot test, there are 10 blots. And five of them are black, white, and gray. And five of them have black, white, and gray, but some color added. And, uh, and there are a lot of scoring. Uh, there have been a number of scoring uh, you know, tests, scoring examples, I should say, scoring systems that have been developed for the Rorschach. But most often uh, today, experienced clinicians simply use their experience with having given a lot of Rorschachs to determine what certain responses mean. Now, let's experiment, though I thought we could uh, try it out ourselves. And so let me give you, this is not one of the 10 blots, but this is kind of the way the blots were created. Now, the question 
that you put forward to people is, what does this remind you of? That's the question. Now we'll, we'll take our class Rorschach. Come up with, you don't have to, don't have to be, you can be anything you imagine. Sure, go ahead. It looks like some kind of flying craft because the edges look like uh, wings. Um, I to me. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, so, the first one we're going to say is flying craft. Okay? Very good. And what else did you want to tell me about that? Flying craft, and it's in motion. Okay. And, uh, this is not part of the craft, but it still looks like two people are kissing. Okay. And are you seeing that? Are you seeing that in a different part of the blot? Yeah. So, so you got a second response, which is two people kissing. Yeah. Are about to kiss. Okay, about to kiss. <laughs> what? Uh, what, what was your comment? <laughs> She said she didn't know where he found that kiss. <laughs> okay. Now, where in the blot? Okay. Well, first of all, let me get a couple more responses. Then we'll go back and we'll explore this. That's very good. Okay. Anybody else? What do you see in this blot? I didn't see that at all. What I saw was a Viking with a mountain range behind him. That's what I see. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I feel better. She saw it too. <laughs> okay, so now we've got a Viking. <laughs> we've got our Viking. Okay, what else do you see in this plot? What do you see here? These are very good. You, you see a beetle. Okay. Okay. Wait a second. That's that's I, I've misspelled that also uh, obviously. So we stay after class and get our own personal prognosis, right? <laughs> beetle. B e a t. Is that right? Well, well, okay. The uh, okay. Now we'll take this. We'll go back to our blot. Now, what, what happens is, see, you get some responses. Then you go back, and you ask the person to tell you uh, where they saw this. So, we'll go back to Mr. Apuni. Where is this flying craft in motion here now? Okay. Going in one direction, you see the jets. It seems, it seems like it's not like a typical airplane. It could be something else, but you mm -hmm. can see the wings. Okay. The, it's symmetrical on both sides. It's the same on both sides. I think it, it's so it's symmetrical. You see these two things coming out as wings. Yeah. And are you using the whole blot here? The whole blot for that. Yeah. The whole blot. Yeah. Okay. Now then, your second one was that you saw two people about to kiss. Yeah. See in the center, like in the, the, the racing where the white is. Mm -hmm. I see like, like the side profile, like two faces. I see like a nose, mm -hmm. uh, a mouth. They got big lips. They got big lips, yeah. <laughs> they're, not, they're not touching yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you see them coming toward each other? Huh? Are they coming toward each other? They're going towards each other. So, so they're in motion. Yeah. Okay. This is very good. <laughs> okay, now, where is uh, our Viking uh, with a mountain range behind them? So, okay. Ms. Hofstetter. He's right in the middle, and he's got his big hat on, okay? And, and the little things coming in there is just like, you know, the fur on his hat, okay? You see his two little eyes, and his mouth is down here, and his neck, and then you see his shoulders coming down, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the mountain range is behind him. Okay. And uh, now, so you're using the whole blot for this, are you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we've got our beetle. <laughs> Mr. Jones, where is this beetle? <laughs> 
arm and then the wings are spread out though. And then like there's still a palm in the front. You really can't like be able to dump Okay. So uh, you have <laughs> okay. Are you using the whole blot? Is yes. that okay? Okay. Now, let me tell you. <laughs> and and Ms. Bro was saying none of those things are there. <laughs> now, th this is very good. First of all, these are these are very creative responses. But and and often when you when you give uh, this to bright people, you get responses like this. First of all. The things that uh, people, examiners look for is, do you use the whole blot? And the, 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 that is, at least for your first or second response, do you use the whole blot? That's seen as, you know, a person more has the ability to look at the big picture. That the person is, is not frightened uh, of the big picture and can look at it and decide that um, they can deal with all that stimuli. The second thing that comes is, can the person come up with a concept that, you know, at least if you use your imagination, you can imagine that this concept really is, uh, that, that this blot really could resemble this in some way. And of course, that this response really met that. Now, where you get into, uh, in, in terms of, you know, what's been learned about this, about whether people are creative and bright, when you actually see the blot in motion, that is, in this case, he sees the craft in motion. Now, you would rarely find that uh, a, a person who is certainly very depressed or a person who has some psychosis really would not see that. that that's a very advanced concept to be able to see uh, that there's actually action taking place, that, that motion is occurring. Uh, and those kinds of things you know, suggest that a person really has a lot of resources, a lot of creativity. Now the next one that comes up then is where the blot, uh, you, you, the person takes a portion of the blot. And I think you took a portion of the blot, didn't you, for the two people kissing? Yeah. And here, uh, first of all, he's, he's taken people. Now, there, uh, even going through all 10 blots, uh, there are some individuals who will never see a living person. Uh, seeing living people in the blots, again, is seen as a very mature response. Uh, and, and, and the fact that these two people are about to be intimate is also very important. Uh, because, you know, it, it's showing that uh, there's affection. Uh, it's showing that these are adults and they're going to do something positive, which is uh, quite different than the example I'll give you in a minute. Then we have the Viking. Uh, with a mountain range behind him. And again here, in order to do that, you, you probably had to see this in three dimensions. Now, uh, that's again a, a, a very advanced response. Uh, people don't normally uh, see these uh, things in three dimensions. Seeing them in three dimensions, again, tells you something about the, the creativity of people. And then we, we had, after you get through these, people begin looking for things. So we get our beetle. Now, what I didn't ask you is, is the beetle doing anything, or is the beetle kind of just sitting there, or? Okay, not doing anything, but, uh, but, it, but, it, but it's a beetle, it has wings, and you can show where uh, this is. Now these are all, you know, very integrated, very high level responses to this, and, uh, and what it would tell you if you, you've got a Rorschach like this is you're going to be working with someone who really has a lot of ability to reflect, a lot of ability to imagine, a lot of ability to be creative, uh, somebody who's in touch with the real world. I mean, they're all uh, very positive. Now let me, for example, let me give you one more. We can try if I can bring this. Uh, let's see. Uh, as soon as I get this thing to work. Aha! Okay, I've got you a new blot now. Now, when you look at this blot, what kinds of things do you see? I see a skull. Okay, you see a skull? Like a flaming skull. A flaming skull, okay. And you've got a flaming skull. 
And where do you see that? Well, just the shape of the the main figure. Uh -huh. uh, uh, it takes sort of a skull shape, and then it has two eyes, and kind of like where the teeth would be is that yellow part. Okay. And uh, and, and would you say the teeth are yellow, or is it you just using the yellow to identify? I'm just using the yellow to identify. Okay. What else do you see here, Mr. Opuni? It, it's like a um, like a like a map. Like it seems like a, like an overview, like a map, like an enclosure. And I don't know, like the orange part could be I don't know bodies of water. Then I don't know, but it seems like just like a basic map. Okay. Okay. So you see a map. And you see water, okay, and and it's the orange part that's the water, okay. What else? I saw breakfast. You saw breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like eggs and bacon, and it's cooking, and steaming up. Okay, so we got that's breakfast. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> what I saw. We got eggs and bacon, <laughs> and it's steaming up. Okay, now, why? Uh, did you see eggs and bacon? Like, what did you use? I, the, the whole thing just like, looks like an egg yolk. Mm -hmm. um, little egg with the egg whites around it, and oh. then the red looks like the bacon. OK. So uh, let's see. OK, now. These are actually very interesting. These are well done. Let's talk about it. Who came out with the flaming skull? OK, Mr. Edmund. <laughs> Tell me about the flaming skull. I don't. I don't know what. The, it's just. It's on fire. Like maybe. Uh, like you know, you go to like a, a grunge rock concert or something, and they always have like demons and stuff on stage, and they light them on fire with pyrotechnics. I don't know. It's not like Satan or anything. It's just a flaming skull. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's okay. Well. Okay. But what's important here is you see action occurring. You know. So again. Uh, you know, this is not just a blot, but actually you're, you're, you're attributing life to it. You're seeing activity going on. Uh, then, let's see, we have our map. Now, when you saw the map, uh, were you using the whole blot? Or? Yeah, at least the whole blot. It seemed like there are like major monuments within that, that map. It's like a basic map, but it has like the major monuments that you need to keep your eyes open for. It's not, a, it's not detailed. Okay, where, and where are these major monuments? Uh, like the black part that goes around, mm -hmm. it's, it seems like it's some kind of like uh, enclosed space, and at the very bottom is like just the opening to it. Mm -hmm. And so like, I don't know, so could it be like a man-made wall or something like that? And okay. I don't know, like uh, like the mm -hmm. circular. They're not really circular, like circular, but like the you know, like the lakes or whatever. They're not really circular or whatever, but it seems like they could be lakes, mm -hmm. or even in like I don't know, the black could be another line. And I'm not sure what the blue. Lines on the outside, it could be. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's very good. Ms. Bolton, <laughs> we got we got breakfast. <laughs> and you saw all of this, uh, the whole thing as an egg with the yellow being the egg yolk. And then the red was bacon on top of the eggs. And it's cooking. And it's cooking. Oh yes, okay. Now that's very important. Again, uh, you know, there's a lot of animation in what is being seen here. Okay, now these are uh, responses you would rarely get from a clinical population. Let me tell you, they, these are very, very good responses, and they're they. Uh, and it was a lot of imagination and what all of you have come up with, and uh, and the fact that you see things uh, that action is occurring, and that these are integrated. The other thing is, uh, like in Ms. Bolton's too, you know, a lot of use of color. Uh, you know, the color is integrated into the picture so that you, you make meaningful use of that. Okay, now our class has uh, given us the example of, of really what uh, mature adults tend to see in this. This is not what would happen in, normally in a clinic population. First of all, uh, what we find is that often if people are very frightened, they, they won't give a whole response like many of you gave. That is, you saw the whole picture and you came up with uh, a meaning for the whole picture. Often people will take a part of it. In fact, if we can just go back to the last one we had that has the color in it. Okay, now, 
in, in this one, for example, there are people, uh, in the, for instance, our obsessive compulsive type person, they might take, see those little, two little dots right below the yellow? Just two small dots. Sometimes a person will respond to that. Their first response will be, I see two islands. And you say, where are these islands? They say, those two dots, that at the bottom. In other words, they will select out the most obscure part of the blot and tell you about something the rest of us paid no attention to. I mean, no one mentioned those two dots as being very important. But for somebody who is frightened of the world, somebody who is frightened of too much stimulation, they look for something that is as neutral uh, and as vague as possible. So you notice they, they don't have to incorporate the color. Uh, they uh, are able to focus on something that's very diffuse. And usually they can't tell you much about it. Uh, the yellow, for example, if someone just chose the yellow and nothing else, uh, then it depends on, on what they, uh, they come up with. If someone said, this yellow is a lobster and there's legs coming out and they were pretty well able to describe it. Uh, that could be quite a, a mature response. It still would be avoiding the whole blot, but at least you know, they would have chosen something that, um, you know, that, that is reasonable. On the other hand, if someone looked at the yellow and said, I see an explosion and, uh, and things are flying in all kinds of directions and uh, and then the person says, and, and in fact, this explosion has hurt people because the red is showing there's blood uh, on this blot. And, uh, and people are dying. And you look there and you say to yourself, I don't think so. That is, this, this is not what's in the blot, but this person, as you listen to their story, uh, you know, is telling you that uh, you know, they see danger, uh, you know, explosions are taking place. Uh, they see you know, people dying, bleeding taking place. Notice how different that is from the responses that we gave. I mean, the, the class response you know, is kind of you know, bound by the certain reality of what the plot actually has. Uh, the class response had a lot of creativity in it, uh, had you know, people seeing various things taking place, even intimate things taking place. Now, that's very different from someone who sees explosions taking place, sees free-floating blood uh, around. And that's how this test got used. And that's how uh, you know, the, the Rorschach most often is interpreted. Now, there really are scoring systems for this. For instance, some people predominantly uh, focus on small things. Some will predominantly focus on uh, the, uh, on just aspects of it. In other words, they can't integrate the plot even if you ask them to. Some people will give many responses like our class did. Others will give like only one. Uh, and in some cases, people can't give any response to the plot. Can't imagine any, when you say, what does this remind you of? Nothing. And that's interpreted as a, a person is really quite repressed, really quite frightened of stimuli. They don't want to see anything there. All right, now. The next test we're going to talk about is called the thematic apperception test. And in the, uh, by the way, the other thing I should have mentioned just before we get, uh, leaving in Rorschach too, it also matters, uh, you know, when I asked you, what does this remind you of? We got responses very quickly from people. And we got these very creative responses. Uh, some people will take a long time to respond. And just the, the time lapse tells you that the person is frightened of, of the stimuli itself. Uh, and then if after a long time they respond to a very small part, uh, that's an unusual thing, but it does tell you that this is somebody who is very careful, someone who wants to keep a lot of control in life, someone who responds to only a very minuscule part of the stimulation that's before them. So uh, even the timing matters. Now when we go to our next test here, the thematic apperception test, which is called the, the TAT more popularly. This is a test actually uh, uh, that has 30 drawings. And it has 30 drawings of people, objects, and landscapes. One of the cards is completely blank. And, uh, and in that particular card, what you simply do is you show someone a blank card. And you say, imagine a picture. And then the person gives you the picture. And then you move on from there. 
uh, to ask them to tell you a story. Uh, the instructions that you give with this are, I'm going to show you a picture, and I want you to tell me what you see. Right now, what you see. What led up to the events in the picture? What is going on currently? And what will happen in the future? And then you ask the person also to give you the thoughts and feelings of the characters. OK, now, here is TAT picture. This actually is right out of your textbook. This is, by the way, a real TAT card. Uh, and the test people have allowed this to be used. OK, so here we are. And I want you to tell me what you see, what led up to the events in the picture, what is currently going on, what's going to happen in the future, and what are these people thinking and feeling? OK. Who wants to give me a response? OK. I feel like this lady, is, uh, she, she looked as though she's seen the man of her life. And her mother in the back is looking at she, you know, she's making the worst mistake of her life. OK. OK. So now, what led up to this? How did these two get together? Mm -hmm. Daughter and a mother. Any things you want to tell us that happened before this particular picture? Okay. What are the people feeling or thinking? One of them looks like she's excited, the other one looks like she's sad. Okay. Happy and sad. Okay, so we got one person who's happy, one person who's sad. What's, how's this going to work out? What's going to happen in the future? In that situation, mom is right, so she's got to be worried about Mom is going to what? Okay, mom is going to end up being right, okay? So the outcome is that the main character is making a mistake. Mom's very concerned, but in the end, mom will, will convince her. Okay? What else, what does someone else see in this? Okay, Mr. Opuni? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, for me, it seems like the uh, young woman and the old woman, they're like the same person. And because the old, I don't know, the older woman, she has her hand on her, on her mouth, which makes me think she's like reflecting on, I don't know, something maybe the past, maybe her past. Okay. So the old woman is reflecting on her past. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what else is happening? Okay. And who is looking forward and who's looking back? Uh, the younger the younger version of the woman is looking forward, though. I don't know, it's kind of weird. Like the okay. older version is looking back in a way. Okay. Okay. What led up to this picture? Um, I think something like, like a memory could have, like a memory could have triggered it. Like a certain moment could have triggered it, so maybe that's why this older woman's looking, uh, looking back at this past self, or whatever. I don't know. Maybe this, the same woman has a certain meaning for the for the both of them, so maybe that's why they're all in the same picture together. Okay. And uh, how are these people feeling? What are they thinking about? Well, I think like the younger one, she looks like. I don't know, she's anticipating or she looks hopeful. The other one, she has this little smile. Mm -hmm. 
on her face is not like a big smile. Maybe it's like maybe a smile a tinge a little bit of regret. Mm -hmm. Okay. How is it going to turn out? Mm, I think you know, the image of the younger son will pass away and like the older one will, you know, have that moment, they move on from that moment and just have like the, I don't know, the feeling, the bittersweet feeling with her. Okay. And what did you say would happen with the younger woman? I think, I think the younger one is like, an image, like the image of her past self and I think it will fade. Okay, so in this now, you've transformed the younger woman is actually the image of the older woman. Yeah. Okay, fine. Any other way people see this picture? It's very good. The wise old woman is looking over the young woman's shoulders slightly as like, like watching the young person make a mistake of you. Okay, so the wise... That's it. Mm -hmm. I wonder why I can't write here. Well, let's see. Let me just try this. Okay. Okay, wise old woman looking over the shoulder. Okay. Okay, and watching naive young woman who is making a mistake. Okay, how did they get into this situation? I don't know, this could be her mother. Or, uh, I don't know. And, uh, it's like, yeah, I mean, I think she's probably her mother or somebody who well, what do you think will be the outcome of this? Uh... Um, the, the girl will make the mistake, and the old woman already knows she's going to make the mistake. She's kind of smirking because she thinks it's funny. Okay. Okay, now, we look at this, this picture now, and we normally we would give several of these pictures, but this is a very good example because you've got interpersonal interaction. Now, you notice, we look at this picture. What did everyone see that was in common? The older woman is the mother. No one saw this as a grandmother, an aunt, a teacher. Or, uh, uh, people have seen this uh, older person in the back there as a nun. Uh, but everybody here saw this as the mother. The person in the foreground what did we find out about the person in the foreground? Everybody thought she was making a mistake. Yes. She to do something wrong. Yes. Uh, this picture has so much to do with the stark contrast between youth and old age. Well, you certainly get that impression, don't you? That, <laughs> that in our group, there was this sense that there is a conflict between the older and the younger. Uh, no one, for instance, saw mom quite as being benign. Uh, in fact, uh, I think we leaned a little more towards that mom is a bit disappointed uh, with the daughter. Uh, certainly knows the younger figure, in fact, it seemed unanimous in your stories, the younger figure is making a mistake. And there wasn't uh, a lot of optimism that this is going to, to work out uh, in a positive way. In fact, you know, the description in the class more is, it'll work out, I mean, things will get better, uh, but it was vague. And we were vague about, you know, what would happen in the future. Now, if you were the, the person who was the clinician in this, then what would you, in our, our group photo, or our group response to this picture, what would you be thinking would be things we should explore further? The person's relationship with, with their mother. Um, my opinion would be that, um, that whoever the person is that sees the older and the younger and sees the, the older's disapproval has, has a need to have the older's approval. Mm -hmm. 
that for some reason they, they've never felt accepted, never felt, um, I don't know if you'd go so far as to say never felt loved, but never felt, you know, that they quite met up mm -hmm. the person's standard. Okay, that's good. That's good. The, uh, what else might we, we draw conclusions on from the way in which, you know, we came up with our story about this person? Well, what about the relationship that the, the young woman is having? What are we saying about the young woman? That she's not able to make good decisions, that she's not able to make right decisions. We're not optimistic about her, are we? Nope. <laughs> we don't think that she is necessarily making a good decision. And in one of our versions, uh, you know, mom is warning her, and she's going to listen. And, uh, and so, you know, she will not make the mistake uh, of continuing this relationship. In another version, I think we were saying it's, it's fairly unclear uh, what will happen. Now, when you use these tests, of course, what you're doing is you're, you're always looking for hypotheses. That is, if you give this, you wouldn't then say, okay, now that we've got this information, uh, we have to worry that this person is not going to make good interpersonal decisions. Instead, what we would want to say is, it's possible that the lead person here, that is the younger person, is concerned about some important relationship. Perhaps is not feeling very good about the relationship. However, we would then give several more cards that would have interpersonal you know, situations that are different. Uh, some would be you know, peers. And you see you know, like what the person does with it. So that if, as you go on, the person begins talking more and more about these relationships and begins to, uh, to give you some other material about what happened before, that the person had a breakup very recently, uh, that it was very painful, that the person is you know, not certain they want to get into another relationship right away, uh, that the mother originally really was warning them, don't get into a relationship right away, versus someone who might, uh, you know, we might find on subsequent stories, Actually, uh, the person is working very hard. While they have some uncertainty, uh, they think it's their problem, they think the other person is very loving, uh, that they ought to work harder in the relationship. Uh, or, if you got the opposite of that, they think that they're working very hard, the other person is not working very hard, the mother figure here is trying to warn them uh, against that relationship and they have a lot of doubt, then you, know, you would recognize that uh, they are perhaps dependent in a relationship, but it may not be a good relationship. And maybe it is time to get out, and that's what this person is trying to, to work at. So it's getting uh, a theme or a series of themes, and then seeing how they repeat in these various cards that helps you to determine, like, what is it that the person is really struggling with? And in most of these cards, uh, there's more than one person, although some cards there's just one person. And, and what you want to find out uh, about as you move along is what are the consistent themes that come out? And where is their optimism? Uh, where is their pessimism? Uh, is, does the person feel there's, there's a good outcome? Is it the person uh, can give you any outcome? Which might be a suggestion that uh, they're really protecting themselves against the idea that the outcome will be bad. So they don't come up with an outcome because they don't think it'll be a good outcome. Sure, Mr. Can Jones? Can the responses to these uh, drawings be like, specific to their mood at that particular, at the particular moment and not necessarily indicative of their personality? You see, that's really a good question because in psychological testing, uh, you know, here you're saying, well, maybe this is just reflective of how someone is feeling right at that time. Now, if the, uh, any psychological test is just measuring uh, what is going on right now in my life, then it's probably not very helpful. So one of the hypotheses we always present is that this is more, this is a presentation of a more enduring aspect uh, of personality. And, and the reason we say that is because we give out several uh, pictures. So we get you know, several kinds of opportunities for someone to tell us about himself or herself. And, uh, and then we, we draw these conclusions. 
And over time, what we found is usually the way people talk about uh, the interpersonal situations they see probably gives you a lot of clues as to what their strengths are, uh, what their fears might be, uh, what their concerns are. And so, uh, you know, we think of this as being, uh, you know, a pretty uh, accurate measurement of uh, a more basic function. But the question you ask, you know, is an important one because if actually all we're catching is how somebody happens to feel today, then that would be an awful lot of effort to test someone and it really wouldn't have much meaning. But most of these tests really do have capture more enduring aspects of personality. Okay. Now, in, in, by the way, you might wonder, uh, you know, you look at the picture I, I, I showed you and you might think, you know, it's a pretty old, I mean, this is not exactly the way people are now. You know, shouldn't we dress these people up more modernly? Uh, actually, that's been studied, and they found out it doesn't really make any difference. Uh, also, there's, uh, these have been done on African Americans. Found out it really doesn't make any difference. That is, people look at these pictures, and what, basically what they see in this case are an older woman and a younger woman. And uh, the fact that they're dressed not fashionably is not important. Uh, what race they are is not a big deal for people. Uh, and so we have found that by trying to make these things more current, like they have people very fashionably be dressed and be African-American or be Asian, doesn't change. Doesn't, you don't get different stories. You don't get a more accurate uh, picture. So they've actually stayed with these pictures uh, for a very long time. Okay. Now, I'm going to move on to another kind of test. And the projective uh, techniques as you can see, the last two I've used, the Rorschach, as you can see, first of all, I have to show you the blot. And, and you need an examiner who really has some ability to, uh, you know, to guide someone through the test. That is to uh, make a lot of observations. Uh, you know, I show you the blot. I see how long does it take you to respond. Uh, I ask you, you know, what you're seeing there. And I ask you whether you use color and if you use the whole blot and all that. Or in these stories, uh, you know, I probe for what are you thinking and feeling and what happened before and what happened after. Well, as you can see, that takes a lot of time uh, to do that. Very different than the tests I said before where someone can just hand you a booklet and say, answer all these things true or false and hand them back and have a machine scored. So if you're going to use these last two tests, uh, you know, you need to have a pretty uh, special reason for why you would want to devote that much time uh, and energy into examining someone. And so usually these tests are done when there's a diagnostic dilemma. That is, you're not sure of why somebody is suffering whatever it is they are suffering. And often these tests uh, are helpful in giving you clues as to what kinds of strengths that people have. Like if in every uh, picture, the main character fails at whatever they're doing, uh, or the main character uh, dies, or the main character uh, is always very depressed. Uh, that's very different than if there's a mixture where sometimes the main character is hurt but struggles back. Uh, sometimes the main character is very depressed but they can see getting over it versus uh, the main character is depressed and thinks they're going to get more depressed. So when you're uh, you know, examining, you're trying to get a feel for not only what is going on with this person now, but what does this person really think is going to unfold in his or her life. Now there's another projective technique that falls kind of in between the, uh, the more basic personality tests like the MMPI and say the Rorschach or the TAT, and that's the sentence completion test. And in sentence completion tests, what you do is you give someone a, a stimulus and, uh, and you ask them to complete the sentence. That is, you give them the beginning of the sentence and then you say, uh, why don't you complete this? Now the sentence, the, the stimulus you may give them may be as, uh, as vague as I, and you ask the person, complete the sentence. Uh, or it could be, on my last vacation. And then you uh, ask them to complete the sentence. Uh, or you might uh, have a stimulus like, my father. Uh, or uh, I secretly. And, uh, but uh, 
let's just take uh, let's take I secretly. Now, what do you think some people might respond to I secretly? Give me some thoughts about how do you think somebody might complete that sentence? I secretly hate my boss. Hate my boss. I bet you a lot of people respond that way. Okay, so I secretly hate my boss. What else, Mike? I secretly dressed. Okay, that's great. I secretly dress up like a clown. Okay, imagine other things. What else might people say? Secretly, I. Oh, let's see. We, our, our, our thing rebelled against that. Okay. Uh, secretly, I. Uh, let's see. I got this. Well, looks like they don't want this to be our. Uh, Okay. Why won't this work? They don't want us to put down here that someone cheats on their wife. Okay. Nope, it's gone again. Well. Okay. This. Ah, we got it. Nope. Now it's gone into uh, well, Scott. Okay, I got it back. We know what this means. What else? Okay, let me point this out to you. You just got a little bit of time left. What you can see is, with this projective technique, look at the differences that we get. And if you use these, one is the person admits to anger. You know, like I hate my boss. Very important part of their life. The second one, person admits to, to something that he doesn't tell other people. You know, I dress up like a clown. Uh, you know, it, it's a very honest disclosure. The third person, I cheat on my wife, is revealing a deep secret, uh, something that has great consequences, perhaps, for the person. So you can see by giving this, this kind of vague stimuli what you really learn uh, about someone and the kinds of things that happen. Uh, you know, when you give this kind of stimuli, that is, you can get very, very different pictures of people, and you learn a great deal about them clinically. Okay, that then tells us about what projective techniques are like, uh, and we'll go on to other things in our next lecture. We're going to be moving to psychotherapy.